unfortunately, this bottle's not not sellable. The mice got to it. The center of the cork is completely chewed out. There's maybe maybe five percent of the cork around the outside and and at the bottom that's not complete. It's a miracle that it wasn't it chewed chewed completely through and evaporated. So we got some drunk little mice running around. Welcome back. It's episode 260 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and here's what's happening in your bourbon world. Drizzly has launched a new program called BevAlk Insights. It's a new resource for data and insights into the beverage alcohol industry and its growing e-commerce sector. The platform launches with more than a dozen pieces of content, each geared towards supporting retailer growth and new articles to be released weekly. Currently available is a comprehensive hard seltzer report a review of best practices for alcohol delivery and tips on optimizing inventory for the summer. You can read more at BevElkInsights.com. Do you want to know how to date an old whiskey bottle? You know, like those ones you found in your grandma's crawl space. Or, I mean, you wish you found. Some people have the craziest luck. Anyway, Michael Veach has a great new blog article on how he deciphers them. He first starts by looking at the glass and seeing if it's a hand or mold blown, which is going to place it in a certain era. Then there's the label, when the words straight, blended, pure food, and even imitation were used on the labels. Lastly, he looks at the tax stamp, because 1984 was the last year that required him. There's a lot of information here for those ultra-rare dusty hunters on Michael Veach's blog, and you can get that link in our show notes. The secondary market isn't new for most of us, but there's a pro and a con balance that comes into play. This week, Whiskey Advocate published their headlining article that was in their latest front cover issue called Inside the World of Black Market Bourbon. It looks at Insta flippers, the retailers, the counterfeiters, and even quotes from the bourbon podcast that you're listening to right now. This story really paints a picture to what most of us bourbon enthusiasts already know, but solidifies the statement of, a broken system that still works. You can get the link to the Whiskey Advocate article in our show notes as well. Diageo has announced that we'll be building a new $130 million distillery in Lebanon, Kentucky that will be the first ever carbon neutral facility. Bullet will be the first and lead brand produced at the new facility, which will supplement production at the Bullet Distilling Company in Shelbyville, Kentucky. I just mean they're cranking out a lot of Bullet bourbon. This site will be powered by 100% renewable electricity with a capacity to produce up to 10 million proof gallons per year. In Bourbon Pursuit news, we did our Jack Daniels rye barrel selection this week. Can you say Cinnabon? Oh man, was it good. We are currently projected to do over 20 barrel selections for our Patreon community this year in addition to access, or should I say first access, to all of the Pursuit series. We're also heading into our next recording season, and we've got a lot of great guests and topics lined up. And we appreciate your support in helping us grow and sustain the podcast. You can get more information about the Private Barrel Club, all the barrels that we have coming in, and how you can help support us at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. So do you have a really old bottle of whiskey? What about a unicorn that's coveted by every bourbon enthusiast out there? You could always risk it and sell it on the secondary market and ship it to someone after getting some form of e-payment, or you could take it to an auction house. We're joined by Joe Hyman of Skinner Auctions to talk about what it's like to buy and sell high-end bottles at a legit auction. We talk about everything from the bottles they accept, how they process the auctions, and how they even look for fakes. Every year, a whiskey breaks the ceiling for sales, so who knows what 2020 has in store. Have you ever wanted to get barrel bourbon shipped right to your door? Well, now you can. You can get access to their award-winning products right online. Go to BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. We're always complaining about everything today. In whiskey, we seem to be complaining about where something's made, whether it's sourced, the backstories, and li- listen, I'm as guilty as anybody, but there is a term on a label that basically would end all complaining if all distillers 
pushed for this in their own respective distilleries. It's bottled in bond. This goes back to the to the 1800s when distillers were trying to protect themselves from really bad whiskey that was entering the market. Basically, people were adding things to whiskey like prune juice and tobacco spit and all sorts of unsavory materials that doctors, they would get the whiskey and they would say, oh, this doesn't work. This isn't helping our patients at all. This isn't pure whiskey. So the distillers, druggists, and doctors all worked together diligently to create a piece of legislation that still stands today. And as I look at the Spirits Works Bottled and Bond California Straight Rye Whiskey, that's when I realized that Bottled and Bond, mm, that is that is the terminology that if everybody went after it, if every single distiller in the United States of America said, you know what, let's focus on making everything bottled and bond, then that would end a lot of the complaining that we have about labeling. Why? Because that stuff is still rigid. But at the end of the day, it means it has to be at least four years old. So you at least got a little age on the whiskey and it has to be 100 proof. So it's coming in at a pretty decent proof. Now, some of us want cash drink. Some of us want lower than that. But at bottom and bond, for many of us, it is the sweet spot. And it comes with the protection of the United States government. And you may laugh at that but it still does mean something, at least in whiskey. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. Just search for my name, Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny, Ryan, and Fred going virtual today. And we have an exciting topic, which is something that we've never had on the show before and it's looking at rare and vintage spirits and whiskeys and stuff like that but through an auction house right i mean we've we've talked about secondary markets before we talked about other kind of stuff but this is something that is uh you know when you when you look at when start when bottles start hitting you know 300,000 500,000 even 1 million dollar bottles this is where the places like that end up happening so i think it's uh it's going to be an interesting show what do you guys think yeah i mean this is a world i have never been a part of or understand because we've done auctions but not legal ones and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe some raffles or you know mega balls or something but uh uh no i'm a, i'm really pumped for this because yeah the only auctions i've been to is the ones fred's of host fred's hosted which he's awesome at but uh no, thanks, yeah man. i'd love uh to hear how the big boys do it you know they do this for a living for all the time you know one thing i'm looking to learn is like why is there such a disparity before uh disparity between like american whiskeys and other types of spirits look we all get uh we all get in an uproar about pricing but when you look at the auctions the the international auctions like uh american whiskey is kind of like the stepchild it gets it gets very little action in comparison to cognac and scotches which are going for hundreds of thousands of dollars in some in some cases so that's that's one thing I'm excited to learn today. Yeah. And about wine. I'm like, why the hell is wine so expensive? You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you only get four glasses out of that damn bottle. Yeah. You know, half, it's, half, <laughs> A large chunk of the wine just moves from place to place. It never actually gets drunk up. Um, <laughs> there's some, some of the bigger auction houses, they have massive uh, um, warehouse um, facilities. And they just move it from one place to another. And, you know, somebody, somebody who buys it today is going to sell it next year and they just, they just shuffle it around in their own warehouse. <laughs> well, there we go. Let's, let's dive into it a little bit. So you heard his voice already and let's go ahead and introduce him. So today on the show, we have Joe Hyman. Joe is a specialist in rare spirits for Skinner Auctions. So Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So before we kind of really dive into, you know, auction houses and everything like that, we kind of want to know a little bit more about you. Like, how did you start like getting into spirits and really what eventually led you into this kind of world? I was, we were a Scotch family, primarily my grandfather, both grandfathers like their Scotch. Um, so I guess it came, it came through, through that. Um, and then as the story goes, my father was, I guess, overseas somewhere and he found two rare bottles of whiskey back in the fifties, um, one just said very rare old scotch and the other one that's all it said on the label and the other one 
was uh, Valentine's 30 year old. And he brought them back and gave them to my grandfather who put them on a shelf and looked at them and waited for a special occasion to open them up. And then my father inherited them back when he, when, when he passed away. And uh, so what did he do? He put them on a shelf and he looked at them for another 30 years until, until, uh, uh, you know, there was a special occasion that came along. Um, I, somewhere along the line, they had opened up the very rare bottle and, uh, and he and some uncles killed it one night for a special occasion. And then the third bottle, the other bottle, the uh, 30 year old Valentine's, yeah, it was on the shelf and we were allowed to look at it and we weren't allowed to touch it. And, you know, eventually my older brother got engaged and cracked it open at his engagement party. And, and that was my whiskey epiphany. Um, uh, you know, before that I drank a lot of Johnny black. If I was with my Tennessee friends, I drank a lot of the other black label. Um, you could say it. it's fine. They're all good friends here. Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I, I like giving a dig cause it's like, the biggest place in the world. And, uh, um, uh, so I just give them, give them a little dig by not mentioning them. Um, interesting. There's, I, I want to know the psychology behind this. What's going on here. What, what's up with, what did Jack Daniels know. do to you, Joe? Oh, nothing. Uh, you know, it was, it's, it's good. It's, it's excellent, excellent whiskey. Um, I, I'm just not big on, on a lot of hype type things. And when things get like too big and too hyped, I myself just, kind of shy away a little bit um so you know that's just my own little little uh, uh peccadillo so i i drank a lot of johnny black and you know and for a special occasion i'd get a little bottle of uh glenlivet or something or glenfiddich and that was fine until about 1993 when we sampled this 1950s 30 year old uh valentine's and it was just a complete eye-opener and i just started down that path uh, you know, once you eat from the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, uh, there's no going back. So, uh, uh, and and most most whiskey enthusiasts have that moment where where it, there's an epiphany and, and and it's just something different from what they've drank all their lives, and all of a sudden it's you know I got to find more stuff and rare stuff and and you know and back back in the early mid '90s like. The bottles that that are going those 1960s and 70s vintages that are going for thousands of dollars today were were often a hundred bucks or 200 bucks then which was crazy money for for something then now everything's just absolutely exploded but that's how i started getting into it and at some point i decided i you know i really want to do this for a living but a lot of the brand ambassador jobs you're it's either it's either you come up through the company or your heavy sales background and and you know you're moving sideways from from industry to industry uh so it was it was banging my head against the wall trying to trying to find something and you know just by by happenstance you know seven eight years ago bottoms was looking for somebody and that's where i started my my I, I called them up and uh, yeah, they were looking for somebody. They weren't looking for somebody. And that day I got a call from a, from a friend of mine uh, who had just spoken to a mutual friend of ours, uh, John Hansel, who was friendly with the CEO of, of Bonhams. And I called up John and I said, Hey, I heard you, uh, you got some men over there. And he says, yeah. And he said, yeah, cause I've been, I've been trying to, you know, contact them and it just, don't seem very interested. So he said, well, let me see what I can do. And, and by 20 minutes later, I, I got a call from the, from the guy who would, was kind of short with me. Uh, the boss wants your info right away. And it's like, it just got the ball rolling there. And, and, and it was, the rest is history. <laughs> I spent a couple of years at, uh, at, uh, at Bonhams and they decided they didn't want to do whiskey anymore. And they closed up and I live in Boston. So I said, you know what? Why don't I just uh, go local? It's been a, a happy move ever since. Well, that's awesome. I think uh, I kind of want to rewind back a little bit and touch on some things you said there. So, you know, you had mentioned having that 50-year-old scotch for the first time and that kind of being the, the eye-opener. I know that we've all sort of had those epiphanies, but, you know, did it feel like it ruined you a little bit? Like nothing else could compare to this this kind of moment and you, you kind of have that itch to find more stuff? 
yeah, that's basically what it is. You know, it's it's uh, it's like anytime there's a, a first time, it's that extra special thing. And when when you have a, 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 an affinity for something, and then all of a sudden you it reaches another level, then you know there's there's no going back. Yeah, I, I think we've all had that. Like Fred, what, do you remember like what that that epiphany bottle was for you that you kind of realized like, oh my gosh, there's there's so much more and American whiskey and bourbon than what I thought. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Overholt. Um, it was, um, I don't remember the exact bottle, but it was, it was a rye, uh, it was a rye whiskey that kind of, and this was maybe 2001, 2002. Um, and, um, yeah, that was, and what it, what it was, was it just kind of like, uh, made me realize that there was a lot of flavor in, in whiskey. And this was before I had any, any inkling I would become what I am today and spend my career around whiskey. But that was like, um, at that time, I dare say I was drinking some spirits that I make fun of now. So, you know, so that, uh, overhold bottle was kind of opened my eyes or my palate, if you will. I but think- it definitely did not get me to, um, to like jump in the game of, you know, spending money on, uh, <laughs> on whiskey's, <laughs> Like you have, you know, what you kind of curate, Joe, like what, let's, uh, w- take us through the process of how you get these rare bottles. More often than not, I mean, just, just from having done this for a while and being around the whiskey community for a while. So we're, we're looking at, you know, 25 plus years that I've been, you know, doing this and having, you know, being in whiskey clubs and and going to events and, and other things that you, know, you get kind of a reputation for 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 that, that kind of thing. And uh, when I started doing this professionally, then it, it just carried over. And, and people people often say, "Oh, where do you come up with these things?" And, and you know, where do you find them? And generally, it, my answer is that they kind of find me. Um, oftentimes, either it's through word of mouth that oh you know, you're the guy to speak to, or they've done very well with, with this kind of thing in the past. And, and, and people call me up and say, Hey, I've got this bottle. And sometimes the, the big boys don't, don't want to be involved in a single bottle or, or something like that. And, or just not really attuned to, to some of these rare bottles that are, that are out there. And how do you, how do you get around like some of the, um, we know about the like shipping laws and the, all the uh, all the legalities of, of of selling alcohol. What what is it like for an auction house in terms of um, selling alcohol? What kind of license you have to have? Well, in the U.S., to be able to auction wine and spirits, you need to be connected to a retailer, and you're basically piggybacking their liquor license. Um, to do this thing. And in, in the cases of, of someplace like us, we had, and even Bonhams had a retail partner. That's how the stuff gets sold and out the door. Some of the, the much bigger places have their own retailer a retailing branch or even working backwards. Some of the retailers started doing auctions. So that's the way it is on the way out on the way in it's it's difficult you know sometimes you have to go get it and i'll do road trips around the country at least at least the east the east coast and uh out, out to the midwest in kentucky and and back to to bring in the things that you know they're too expensive to ship really and it, i wouldn't necessarily um rely on you don't really know how well the people are going to pack stuff so sometimes sometimes yeah we had we had a guy with a, a bottle of black Bomore, and I specifically told him if he's going to ship it, he needs to, um, and he was using a licensed shipper too. So you have to remove the bottle from the box so it won't jostle around and damage the cork and the wax and, and all this other stuff. And and you know, I always tell people, if, if it's in a wooden box of some sort, take it out, wrap it really well, and then either pack the box separately or ship the box separately entirely. And 
this guy basically just wrapped it in like a plastic bag and put it in some crappy used box and bubble wrap or something. And, and what ended up happening was it got to the, you know, the, the distribution place and they said they, they could smell it. And they said, yeah, we can't, we can't do anything with this. It's uh, it's leaked. It's alcohol. It's, you know, and turns out that that's what the guy did. And, and the wax was completely worn away and the cork had, the stopper had failed and the cork had fallen in and, and 90% of the liquid fell out. Ouch. That's gotta be yeah. uh, a tear I'll jerker for gone. somebody. You know, and at the time it was like a four or $5,000 bottle. And, you know, he, he tried to file a, uh, an insurance claim. Um, and it turns out that he never even clicked on the insurance for the, uh, for the oh. package. <laughs> and, and it's, it's his own fault for the way he packed it also. Yeah, then he drunk tweeted all kinds of bad stuff about us, and <laughs> but so it's that, that's that's why it's it's um, difficult getting stuff in sometimes. But you know, we do have a truck that goes out to does, does pickups for other other departments, and I try to line people up. And, oh, you're going to be in California? Okay, I'll stop in a couple of places in the LA area, pick up a few boxes from somebody, or or on the way back. If they're coming back through from Southern California, they'll come through uh, Arizona and New Mexico and Texas, and they'll make stops along the way and pick up a box here, a box there, and you know it 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 just it adds adds a lot. And uh, you know we uh, have have trucks that go to Florida, um, guys out in Chicago right now. So you just got basically your own delivery service that goes out there and does it, which is pretty nice. I was thinking that well, you, have to, you have to do it, you know, so if, if, if what is it, the expression, if, uh, if the mountain doesn't come to Muhammad, Muhammad goes to the mountain. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure it's all free too, Kenny. You know, it's just part of the fee. Yeah. Right. Um, it's gotta well, be baked I mean, into it. If, if somebody, somebody is going to, uh, depending on where it is and how far the, uh, the truck has to go to pick stuff up, uh, oftentimes the people just have a box. And they'll meet them on the highway somewhere at a rest stop at lunchtime and uh, hand it over. And there you go. All the paperwork's done uh, ahead of time. And uh, they just, they just sign, sign each other's copies and, uh, and he takes the box and, and, and gone. It sounds awfully familiar. It sounds just yeah, like regular like, parking, just like us. Yeah. Parking lot handoffs. It sounds like pretty, pretty familiar. So I guess like I was thinking that, I mean, are there times when you have something that's like a super high dollar value bottle and you, I mean, you'll hop on a plane and go somewhere to like hand, hand get it or something like that. Uh, it hasn't really happened for me to go fly out and pick up a bottle, something like that. I mean, it would have to be pretty hefty to, uh, for me to do that. But we've, we've done other things where, you know, once upon a time I flew down to uh, Florida and rented a car and met a few people over there and stopped in Atlanta along the way back and, uh, filled up the trunk. Sounds like one a pretty good the, trip then. Yeah, one wow. of those bottles was a uh, was, uh, old Vatican Glen Livet, eighteen sixty two. So you know your scotches pretty well, man. So it sounds like so you're you're pretty well versed in the Scotch world. Kind of kind of talk about how like American whiskey is, and, and if it is like how is this starting to play into the auction scene as well? Well, the American whiskeys are are, are booming, even in the auction world. Um, you know, you've got your usual suspects that. Like everybody sells the Pappy Van Winkles and the and the, the VTAX and all all that stuff and some of the Four Roses limited editions and uh, you know any of that kind of thing. Old Taylor uh, uh, Tornado surviving bottles and and certain rare bottles that everybody's chasing. So that stuff is you know everybody can sell that because everybody knows what they are. It's uh, the, the the difficulty is when things get a little bit more esoteric to kind of figure out what what the deal is but you know we've been doing a lot with with the the older rarer bottles and uh i think that's one of the reasons why why people are coming to me with with them and to skinner in general so what do you what do you define as and this is actually a question that's coming in from the chat from some of the patreon people that are watching live here what what's a what do you define as a a rare bottle in your instance is it just something that's a limited production or is it something that is it's just got the hype built around it i mean you had mentioned you know van winkle and btac and stuff like that but what is what's what's what do you all define as something rare 
Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily define those things as as, as rare, but, but you know, extremely allocated. I'm thinking more about really old bottles, closed distilleries, things like that, that are extremely rare. And and well, as we're talking about rare, um, I mean, it's a good time to pull this one up. Yeah, go ahead and pull that up. So, oh, oh so. No. So yeah, for anybody that's that's listening right now, so it's a, an OFC. But uh, Joe, I'll let you uh, kind of give a little uh, talk about it a little bit. Um, OFC was the original um, product of Old Taylor. You know, Colonel Taylor came up with the old fire copper, which is now called old fashioned copper. But it was, uh, and they've recently revived the, the the brand in the last few years so if anybody's seen the uh, uh the vintage ofc bottles from buffalo trace this is the exact same logo that they're using um so this one was actually bottled when was it uh yeah the george t stag distillery it had gone through different uh, um iterations over the years it was called the george t stag distillery the uh the albert b blanton distillery at different points then it became ancient age and uh in, in, you know, up till now, it's it's Buffalo Trace, but this bottle was distilled in 1909 and bottled in 1919 uh, at 115 proof. Wow, just before prohibition. Yeah, must have been like one of the first, you know, last things. Actually, it says in the back, uh, June 1919. Wow, that's a beautiful piece of history right there. And the fill level is amazing. The cork is pretty tight, and I've got the parafilm on it just to keep it keep it safe. But um, and actually, the the cork is stamped George T. Stag. Yeah, so that that bottle um, that bottle definitely has uh, has uh, some history to it. it. It was bottled over a hundred years ago. What do you think a bottle like that is going to go for? Uh, I think something like that would probably end up being ten thousand plus at auction. Um, just just from what other other more modern bottles have been going for. I mean, when you get into like uh, a certain rare rye bottles, uh, like the, the Willets, some of the Willets by like, and uh, let's say the Blue Smoke uh, Van Winkle or uh, Linnell's uh, Red Hook at Rye and, and things like that that are going for eight to $10,000 or more are... Uh, uh, and you get something like this, that how often does something like this come along? Unfortunately, this bottle's not not sellable. The mice got to it. The center of the cork is completely chewed out. There's maybe maybe five percent of the cork around the outside and and at the bottom that's not complete. It's a miracle that it wasn't it chewed chewed completely through and evaporated. So we got some drunk little mice running around getting yeah, into well, bottles. There were there were, there were well the it came out of Georgia, actually, a couple of years ago. A um, couple of couple of young guys were doing a basement clean out, and they came across uh, a couple of cases of liquor, and there was a, a complete case of old Oscar Pepper, distilled in 1911, bottled in 1917, wow. and then a second a second mixed case was there was one more Oscar Pepper but bottled in 1915. And then there were like three or four that the corks were completely gone and the, everything was evaporated out. And there was this one, and there was also a Weller dry gin from about 1910. How often does that happen where, you know, you get something in and it's just ruined? Like you can't do anything with it? It's less when... There's like a single bottle or, or just a few bottles, but when somebody's got a, a larger collection, it's been in the basement and it's been bounced around, then you're going to have evaporation. You'll have compromised uh, seals, compromised corks. There are different things. Um, we had a collection out of Texas that there was maybe a, a case or two of Henry Watterson's 10-year-old. Uh, I think it was distilled in... Uh, 1914 and bottled in 1924 and there were a lot of evaporation pretty much all the bottles had significant evaporation maybe a third of the bottles had been you know evaporated out and 
we popped open a few just to see what what they would be like and uh, what was the, they were viable what's the verdict they, they were pretty darn good and uh so we we kept a few for, as pour bottles and we just bundled them up in lots of four and sold them off and uh i'd take them to events and uh i had one at uh bourbon and browns in kentucky a few two three years ago and uh at a vip tasting and it, it it still had some significant punch to it even at you know a hundred years old and and uh and significant evaporation well as i say what's the uh reaction of someone then they bring you this bottle they think is amazing and then you're like nope can't sell it and then are they like well you're full of shit yeah we can or like is it you know do you have to do some mediating or is it no it goes both ways sometimes the people are like are very appreciative of of the time knowing that the thing isn't worth anything and and you've given them a half an hour of of your time to to discuss it with them um and other times you, you get that too, where it's like, oh, that's, that's nonsense. This thing's rare. You know, I don't, can't tell you how many times I get, I've got a, a 50 year, a 50 year whiskey. And yeah, it's, you know, Canadian club from 1970. Uh, <laughs> it's like Pawn Stars. They come in, they're like, yeah, I got this old thing. They're like, no, yeah, you don't. <laughs> like yeah, good try. Yeah. yeah. Now, oh, it's going for it's, that's, that's what they're getting. I know that's what they're asking. You know, anybody can ask anything. You go into a, 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 a high-priced liquor store in New York or Washington or L.A., and you'll see the one bottle of Pappy Van Winkle they got is sitting in the in the showcase with a ten thousand uh, dollar price tag on it. And are they getting ten thousand dollars for it? No, not really. You know, by and large, those things are just. Uh, you know, it's 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 fodder for for people to come in the store and gawk at it, and then and then buy something else. You know, I I curate a good deal of auctions, and I can't and I have occasionally come across some some fakes, some counterfeits, some from the errors of like the 1930s. Actually, uh, what what do you do? How do you deal with the fakes, and what do you do when you see one? How do you spot them? There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find the best stories and the best flavors? Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month Club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 39 states across the U.S. In Rackhouse's April box, they're featuring a distillery that mixes Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two whiskeys from Two Bar Spirits located near downtown Seattle, including their straight bourbon. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. How do you deal with the fakes and what do you do when you see one? How do you spot them? Sometimes there are telltale signs. And sometimes it's really hard to to discern, and unless you opened it up and drank it, you wouldn't you wouldn't know. And uh, even even so, I mean, I, I've I've heard stories. I don't know if how, what the truth is and 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 how accurate it is, but I've heard that a lot of bars even are you know filling filling their uh, pappy bottles with like Weller Antique or something like that. And then selling it as twenty-year-old pappy or fifteen-year-old pappy or something like I don't know. I mean, I I rarely drink in bars, so I I couldn't tell you. And and I'm not in that price bracket of of uh, paying for those things, so I couldn't say. But I, that I've heard that that's that happens, and uh, you know it's kind of shameful. But you know, I guess when money's involved, uh, people do all kinds of things. But yeah, I've had I've had some things where I told people I don't think this is real. And they're insisting it is because they got it at XYZ auction house and they got it at, at, at some retailer or something. And I got, you know, I'm sorry, but it's not, I get, uh, McAllen 18 year olds that, that have like, they're by and large, the it's, it's the 700 milliliter bottles from Europe. And that seems to be those kinds of things. That's where it's happening more often than not. I mean, some of that stuff is starting to filter into the U S markets, 
and uh, I've had I've had to reject a bunch of uh, of those things, and you know you see that the color looks like like light tea or something, and and you, and it's supposed to be uh, you know first filled sherry barrels or something, and it's supposed to have a nice mahogany color to it, and it's and it's really light, and you can see that that they've they've tried to antique the uh, uh, the labels to make it look older because these are like 1960s 1970s vintages, and uh, it's it's just not not right. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 hard for them to, to, but you know, sometimes they realize that that's the case, and uh, you know, they're disappointed. But there's nothing else. But more, more recently, I had somebody uh, called me up. Can you authenticate these these McAllen bottles? Because I think he's got screwed, and he wants to uh, make sure that these bottles are are still okay, you know, or not. And if and he told me specifically, if if they're fake, then destroy them. He doesn't want them to filter back out into the market and have somebody else get screwed, which is, you know, great credit to him because he's probably, he's, he probably lost 10 grand on these bottles or more. One was, uh, uh, and you know, they're basically the, the really, uh, known fakes, the, uh, McAllen blue label 30, which is like one of the most common fakes and the, uh, 79 grand reserva. Which is also one of the most common fakes, and those two were like really bad printing, and uh, it was just you know even you know on the uh, on the capsule, whoever whoever faked them left the N off the uh, McAllen on both both sides. It has on 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 the, around the label it says McAllen and then McAllen again it's twice. So both both of them had had the N missing, and whoever did it came back with a with a black pen and 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 drew in. A script N at the end of the McAllen, and uh, you know all these things. The, the printing was bad. The, the color was bad. It was it's just awful. And the third bottle was a uh, McAllen anniversary twenty five year old. But as soon as I saw the bottle, I knew that you know it's, it's, the bottle shape was wrong. Uh, it had all the right capsules and everything. And the back label was right, but there's there's a special seven year old McAllen that's produced pretty much only for the Italian market. And instead of having the short, squat, bulging neck to the to the to the bottle, it had a long, slender neck, and the bottle was about a half an inch or an inch taller than than the regular McAllens of that period. And I knew right away that it was a it was a swapped label. And when I looked into it more closely, basically that's what was happening in Italy: was the mafia was getting a load of these bottles, and they were swapping out labels. And then reselling them as as McAllen twenty five year olds, which you know, it's a fifty dollar bottle turned into a uh, uh, you know a two thousand dollar bottle. Interesting that the the yeah. mafia is involved there. That's that's pretty. It's yeah. pretty cool. If if they're doing counterfeits, it, you know, it makes sense that the mafia would be involved in some way, shape, or form. Has there ever been an instance where you guys have validated a bottle or thought it was credible? Somebody auctions it, wins it. Then they open it and they're like, "This is not fake," and then it pro- or this is not real. This is a fake, and then it's proven to be a fake. What happened? What would happen in that instance? We'd give them the money back immediately. Uh, I in in uh, I started doing this eight years ago professionally, and all that time in thousands and thousands of bottles that I've sold, there's been one that I had to return for authenticity, and it it slipped through the cracks by by everybody. Actually, what it was was a uh, Van Winkle four-year-old bottled for the Japanese market, the 1980s, and it was supposed to have a yellow cap, and this one had a black cap, and it slipped by me, and you know I had never seen one of them before, so I I didn't know one way or the other, and. The guy that was selling it was fairly reliable and he does a lot of buying and selling and you know he won't won't deal with certain people because of questions of authenticity and stuff like that. And he had gotten it from from an auction house in Europe somewhere. Um, and the guy bought it and he picked it up. He was local, so it was easy. He started bragging to his friends about it and they all told him, no, it's supposed to have a yellow cap, not a black cap. And I, I contacted uh, Julian, and uh, he said, no, it's supposed to be a yellow cap. So I said, okay, bring it in. We'll, we'll 
immediately give you your money back. But that's the only one that I've, I've, I've rejected loads and loads of bottles that nobody ever sees. But that was that was the only one that I, there, there were questions that came up about certain bottles. And if it couldn't be, you know, reasonably authenticated, then we've just pulled them out, not let them go to sale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's a that's definitely a tough game to be in right there, especially uh, you know if somebody. I mean, is there times like that when somebody tries to play stump the chump with you, and and they're like, ah, I think this is authentic, and you're like, no, and here's why. Like, how often does that that really come up? I'd say maybe three, four times a year. It's it's I got it from authentic place, and blah 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 blah, and you know, and and uh, this guy with the three McAllen models, two of the three were were came from a guy that was got a reputation for buying fakes in Europe and selling them here uh, so you know he's he's on the uh, persona non grata list at this point himself and uh, any any of those people that have that kind of reputation they're just like sorry I can't I can't uh, can't uh, accept anything from you so Joe, did you did you uh, get on like the secondary markets and uh, and Facebook to kind of use that, um, you know, for for your efforts there? Yeah, I was kind of wondering how you how you gauge values too. Well, I I try to use like a multitude of, of things. I mean, certain things like the Pappy Van Winkles, they have a very fairly consistent um, track record, so it, that's that's easy enough. But you know, on the, on the other things, I've I've uh, gone to Bottle Blue Book. To see what what things are going for there, I use Wine Searcher to see what what things are uh, going for retail, and I'll look at other auction houses and see if they they come up somewhere else, and and uh, just try to get a feel for uh, for for where it is. I mean, we're going to try to be a little bit conservative, anyways, because it's better to under promise and over deliver than vice versa. But generally speaking. Uh, you know, water finds its own level and, you know, on rare occasion, something will, will fall through and uh, a guy gets a bargain on it. But, you know, by and large, people that are coming to larger auctions uh, with a wide variety of, of spirits pretty much know what, what the values of things are and, and they will, they will get to where they're supposed to be. And then what do you kind of see, like, how does the market go up or down in regards of some bottles too. You know, you had kind of said that, you know, Van Winkles are pretty consistent, but you know, we've, we've all kind of seen that the prices of them have gone up over the years, but at what point are they, do they tail off or do they plateau or anything like that? Where do you, where do you kind of gauge that? We haven't really seen that yet in, in our area. I mean, the, the last 10 years, things have just been going up. So it's like, uh, you know, if, if you've only enjoyed the good times, then you don't know you don't know what the bad times are. So, yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't really hit that point yet. I mean, so, some things have have I don't know if they've leveled off, but they they've haven't increased. They've, they've slowed their growth, so to speak. Though in some areas with with Scotch, it goes through lulls and uh, and peaks. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a, it fell off a little bit for a year or so, and then came back with a vengeance. And you had like McAllen's, these rare McAllen's were doubling and tripling in a year. And it kind of pushed everything else up. What do you, uh, what do you attribute that to? Do you, do you attribute it to like just the rarity of like things just, you know, basically being found or do you attribute to basically maybe more buyers in the market? Like what, what do you think? I think I think it's a combination of things where you've got the hype, and you've got uh, people that are investing, and they're not opening the bottles; they're just investing in them and putting them away, and never see the light of day. So it, it kind of limits what's available in the market. So it pushes pushes the values up. You know, I, I suppose anybody that that hoards a particular item and corners the market on it is going to going to you know set their own price at some point, but. On, on the rarer things that people are opening, you know, those prices keep going up because there's just not a lot of them available anymore. What kind of, and that kind of brings up another point, like the, the kind of clientele that, that you all, um, you know, talk to or cater to. I mean, is it, is it mostly just for the, the enthusiasts, the whiskey nerds, or is, I mean, is a lot of people that are actually just buying this for an investment 
and never intending a drink and maybe they're just going to do what we had kind of talked about at the very beginning of the show where you had a bottle on your shelf for 30 years that kind of just got passed down through the generations and you just looked at it. Yeah, well, it's a little bit of both. You get some some people that are, you know, they want to buy them. They, they either, either they've got a special occasion coming up, so they want whatever, it's their 50th birthday or what have you, and they want to buy a birth year bottle or or something like that. So they're going to buy them and open them at the birthday party or or whatever. At, uh, the son is getting married and, uh, you know, they want his birth year to open at the, at the engagement party or or whatever, any any kind of things like that. Those things are the people that are buying them and drinking them. And you've got people that are specifically collecting. They want every single of a particular brand. Whatever they put out, they want they want at least one of them. And they and oftentimes they want multiples because they want to open them and drink them too. So, you know, it's 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 kind of like antique collecting in the same way where guy gets one and it might be a, a beginner a beginner bottle, so to speak, and then he wants something better. You know, okay, this one's got a bit of a label issue. It might have a bit of a cork issue. And he's just looking for a better and better one to be his primary collector bottle. And then then he can always open open the other one. There's a lot of that going on. And you've got some people that are just buying and hoarding and hoping that, you know, it's going to be their retirement money somewhere down the line. Or, or we've had people on certain things will buy them here. And it was like very blase about, you know, buying here and selling them in Europe. There's a, actually a question that's coming up in the chat right here uh, from Matthew. And he says, I tried to participate in a Skinner auction online last year and was blown away by how fast it went. Any advice for someone wanting to participate in a Skinner auction for the first time? I would say don't, don't have too many expectations because sometimes things are just going to go crazy. And sometimes they're not. I mean, you should look for things that you're interested in yourself. I mean, that's what I do. So, you know, I'm not chasing crazy bottles just because I don't want them. I, I want, I want, I want stuff I can drink. I don't want stuff I'm going to put on a shelf. And, and I mean, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this, this, uh, OFC, uh, someday I'll probably open it up at an event somewhere. But, uh, other than that, you know, I've got maybe a half a dozen or a dozen bottles that are just, just way too cool to open. And uh, I'm buying stuff to drink. And is there that much difference between a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar bottle and a and a two hundred dollar bottle? Um, not necessarily. And that's where like the collecting and the investing is is driving some of the some of the market. And so, uh, I, yeah, I guess like another question I'll, I'll kind of have with that as well is, you know, because people come to you with with bottles of like things that, that they want to auction off and stuff like that. And it never happens to me that, you know, you crawl into grandma's basement and you pull out a, a box of pre-prohibition, you know, medicinal pints or something like that. I mean, I'm sure you've had those times where somebody calls and says they have that, like, does do the butterflies keep, keep like, do they, they start building up for you or is it just as ah, just business as usual today? No, I still get a, get a thrill out of it. I, I just got a call from somebody out in the Midwest and it was the grandparents had a liquor store or something like that. And they retired 50 something years ago and they just stuffed, stuffed everything in the crawl space in their basement of the house they moved into when they retired. And, uh, and it hadn't been touched in 50 years. This guy went crawling around in there for some reason and came across some stuff. Uh, some of us, you know, good cool stuff and some of the stuff is like crazy cool stuff uh, and he had a, a Mackey's ancient from the 1940s that was in absolutely immaculate condition and he had contacted another auction house first and they said yeah we don't do blended whiskey and and you're like okay two, we'll, two, we'll two, take three, it yeah two three thousand dollar bottle uh, some, sometimes those things happen I had somebody local actually uh did a basement clean out and found a case of old Tom gin from 1917. And another auction house told him it was $2,000 value. And by the time I, I had seen the email or the voicemail was lost in my email system. And, and by the time I called them back a few days later, they had already made a, a deal with these other people. And well, I said, 
you probably should have like a five thousand dollar reserve on it because those bottles are five hundred bucks a piece. And and they said, well, the other the other place will will go there, and then the other place wanted seven hundred dollars to transport the case. <laughs> And they said, okay, we had to have an easy out. So we broke broke up the case into three bottle lots and we basically got fifteen hundred for for three bottle lots. But you know, sometimes those things happen. And then I guess the the other kind of question also comes in in regards to like the new American whiskey market or like new bourbons. You know, we we talked about you know BTAC and uh, you know Pappy and stuff like that. But like, are there other things that that you all find interesting that people want to sell? Like even something as basic as something like maybe like Elmer T. Lee or like Four Roses Limited Edition. Like what do you what do you kind of see in in that that regard too? I see, I see it a lot. I mean, we have stuff like that in our in our auctions. I try not to put out stuff that's too new just because I feel a little bit badly about getting into that kind of just a culture of, of flipping, but it's, it's a necessary evil to some degree. You know, if, if something came out in, in June, I don't know if I would put it in a, in a an October auction just because I want it, I want it to be out there first, but you know, I get a lot of people with the, with the B tax and the pappies come out and, and, uh, in October, November, they want they wanted in the sale in February, and you know, I try not to do that, just because I don't want to be in that mode of the flipping aspect of things. Yeah, I mean, I guess you it know, can turn it's you a off. Necessary, it's a necessary evil in in what we're doing, so you got to deal with it somewhat. Oh, for sure. I mean, is there is there something that you look at as something that like we're just not going to sell this? Like, is there something that you all just look at as, you know, off, off hands, it's prohibited. Like, we're just not going to sell it. Well, it was, it was, a, a an antique bottle somebody had. It was quinine whiskey. Mm, yeah. And we had, you know, there was a legal question about whether we could sell it because with the level of quinine in it or whatever, you know. What, 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 okay, sorry, you got to talk to me. I don't. This is above my my pay grade here. I don't know what is. Explain to me what this whiskey well, is. Quinine is. It was. It was like a medicine, and it kind of bridges the gap of uh, of just whiskey or spirit, and going into being something that's actually medicinal, not just you know prohibition era medicinal whiskey. It's it's actually a medicine. Yeah, uh, it's actually still it, used to treat like malaria. Uh, Prior, you know, it was it was one of the main treatments, and it was frequently mixed with whiskey. You know, you sometimes that bottle could have also had cocaine in there. You know, so if it was that kind of right, like, I mean, this, uh, this bottle was from like the 1920s or something, or yeah. or, or or teens, and we 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 did one way or the other. I mean, if we had if just the one bottle, you know, would anybody have said anything? Probably not. But uh, why why risk it? So, Joe, I got a couple rapid-fire questions, and I know uh, Ryan's got one that's burning in his heart to ask you. Uh, man, these are just kind of quick answers for you. What's the what's the record for you? What's the record sale overall for a single bottle? For a single bottle, uh, we sold a seventy-two-year-old Lalique McAllen for uh, hundred ten thousand dollars. What's the record for a bourbon? Uh, for me, somebody paid seventeen thousand for Blue Smoke. Mm-hmm. Winkle. Yep, wow. I've I remember seeing that bottle a few times on some pictures here and there. And what is your cut of uh, like? So if someone brings you a bottle, what's your percentage? We often we have very high commission rates to start, but then it 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 staggers down and it's tiered, so it gets it gets lower. The more items, the higher the value. So you're like a ninety percent commission rate. Yeah, like not quite. Rate. You know, it's it's it starts at thirty, but I think I think a lot of that is is to weed out the stuff that's like two three hundred bucks because we we just don't want to have to spend the time dealing with a two hundred dollar item, uh, and and once once you get into that kind of uh, commission rate, then it's almost like not not worth person selling it, especially if they have to ship it in. So once. Once all is said and done, they might as well just gift it to somebody or drink it 
oftentimes it's usually the, the, the 10 to 20% on the sell mm. side. Okay. Who is cooler scotch buyers or American whiskey buyers? Like who's, who's more of a pain in the ass to work with scotch buyers or American whiskey buyers? I think it's about equal. <laughs> okay. You know, it's the, you know each Damn it. one has its own, its own thing. Uh, the scotch guys are looking for something particular. The bourbon guys are looking for something particular. So it's, it's different, but equal. And do the scotch not the scotch guys? Do they like stick their nose up at the bourbon guys? Like say, like you peasants over so there in American whiskey. Yeah, I, I have. I'm I'm in a whiskey club, and some of the some of the uh, uh, you know it's primarily single malts. Uh, some of the guys are really uh, whiskey snobs. Uh, they would rail against uh, bourbon or rye or something like that. But you know once. Once you bring out something like really good, an old vintage bottle or something like that, they they acquiesce. They say yeah. <laughs> and one of one of the guys who's been so vocal about about his anti bourbonism has actually uh, moved on to uh, to drinking chartreuse of all things. At our at our last gathering, uh, I brought a bottle from the '60s, and surprisingly, half the bottle went. Very nice. Yeah, how about it. How about it. Well, I think, uh, I mean, Fred or Ryan, if you have any other kind of questions, I think that might wrap this up as we uh, we start heading into this because, you know, we've we've kind of got an idea of kind of the lay of the land of really what it is to, A, bring your bottles to an auction house, to be a buyer at it, the kind of bottles you're looking for, where does American whiskey fit into this? And I don't know about you, I mean, I think, you know, Fred, you know, you, you run these auctions a lot of times too, and... I'm excited to kind of see exactly like where American whiskey is going to go uh, in this realm. You know, there yeah. are, there are a lot of people that are, they're buying, they're hoarding and they're, they're hoping for the payday uh, and then trying to wonder exactly like, when is that going to be or what is that going to look like for American whiskey? Because I'm sure that we still have a long way to go in regards of scotch values and everything like that too. Well, I'll tell you, well, the one thing that you know, we always want to compare scotch and bourbon when it comes to these auctions. The one thing that bourbon has a stronghold is charity. Uh, I, I don't see nearly the amount of effort on the scotch side and the auctions um, that you do in bourbon for, for charities. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of major national charities that are creating, um, basically creating their fundraisers around bourbon because bourbon has an audience that shows up and will bid and spend a lot of money. Scotch has yet to seem to break into the American charity game. For sure. For we sure. could teach, we could teach him something. <laughs> at yeah. least, at least we got some, at least we got a small win there. It's a small win. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Joe, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. It was a real, again, a real pleasure to kind of talk to you about, you know, again, Skinner auctions and kind of how you got into whiskey. It was an, an eye-opening opportunity for a lot of us to kind of understand exactly what happens inside of auction houses and, and how things are uh, really ran and, and really where the values come from and everything like that. So if you like what you hear, make sure that you follow us on all the social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere like that. And if you also support the show, go check it out. Patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. So uh, Ryan and Fred cheers and uh, we'll see everybody next week. See you later. Toodles. Toodles.